everybody. Dr. Rick Wallace dropping in on you. I hope that you are having an awesome day to this point. Uh, I'm excited. It's the middle of the week. A lot going on uh, within the dynamics of what we do uh, in Team Wallace. Uh, speaking of Team Wallace, before I get started on what I want to talk about today, which is the impact of traumatic experiences on the ability to develop healthy functional relationships. Uh, this is going to be a two day uh, uh, engagement, so to speak. I'm going to start today and I'm going to finish it up on quantum physics Friday. And there's a reason for that, but I'm going to get into the um, organic uh, side of trauma and the impact it has on developing relationships since this is Relationship Wednesday. Uh, and being that we're going to talk about trauma, I thought this would be a good time to also uh, encourage you to get my wife's first book uh, written a while ago now. So this is the revised version, which was released sometime uh, at the end of la not last year, but the end, year before that, at the end of the year before that. And so um, this book, uh, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, is a chronicle of my wife's life. Uh, the traumatic experiences that uh, were part of her childhood, how it impacted her um, in her development, how it uh, caused a number of different problems, but also how she recovered from it, how she healed, how she was able to rescue herself. And it's so important to uh, understand the importance of your participation in your healing. That this isn't something you can be rescued from. This is something you can be assisted in, and that's where a lot of us get our. Uh, that's where a lot of us get our um, signals mixed up. That's where we find a lot of difficulty in achieving what we're trying to achieve in getting out of the pit of despair, uh, traumatic memory, and so much more. And I'm going to explain what traumatic memory is uh, in a little bit, but. Uh, we are looking for somebody to come along and rescue you. You have to participate in your healing. It is your participation that initiates it. It's your participation that ultimately facilitates it. You can get somebody that will come along and provide mechanisms, provide ideas, provide support, but you are going to have to be the one to put in the work. You're going to have to be the one to believe in the process, to work the process, to experience true healing. See, we talk a lot about cure. But we don't talk a whole lot about healing and see healing is ultimately the most powerful force um, that there is because it says no matter what happens i can recover and the problem is most people don't seek healing most people just want the symptoms to go away the cure but the healing says we're going to meet it at the source we're going to deal with what caused it and we're going to use the ability given to us by God to create a new reality. And that's what's powerful about what God has placed inside of each and every one of us, the ability to heal ourselves, not just emotionally, not just psychologically, not just spiritually, even physically. A lot of what we're dealing with is that we are allowing the way we think to destroy our physical health more than what we eat. And people go, no, no, no. I, I'm telling you, nutritional uh, intake is huge in being able to heal yourself, especially physically, but even mentally and emotionally, what you eat has an impact. But nothing has more of a powerful impact than your thoughts. As a man thinks, so is he. And we're going to get into all of that, but definitely the link for this is in here. Uh, this is one of the most transparent and most powerful books if you want to talk about healing, because when you look at what uh, Marion was able to live through, experience, and overcome, and then reach a point of functionality, then reach a point of heightened awareness, then reach a point of impact. And see, that's what life is all about. Life is about impact. Life is about you taking what you've been given, uh, discovering the, the ultimate purpose in, uh, of, of, of you being here, and then using that to go out and impact other people. It's always about impacting the world around you. It's always about touching lives. It's always about changing, uh, helping people change their situations um, and achieve more in life. So get that. And also, obviously, two other things real quick. If you haven't gotten Critical Mass, the first, the, this is my 20th book. 
which was a milestone for me. Uh, it, it was a milestone, but it was also the starting of a new uh, era in, in, in my writing. And it's the beginning, it's the first book, the beginning of a six book series, uh, Critical Mass, the phenomenon of next level living. Uh, everybody has the ability to, to achieve critical mass in their life. That means having all of the necessary components and elements that are required to achieve the results they're looking for. Uh, that's what critical mass is. And also, finally, uh, you can still pre-order uh, the second book in the series, which is I Am. I Am talks about uh, self-talks, the, the importance of monitoring your self-talk. And so uh, those things are out there. I just want to put those out there. But if nothing else, get that uh, uh, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters. I mean, it's powerful. And to understand the dynamic behind it and understand the motive behind writing it is powerful as well. Uh, now, let's talk about relationships. Let's talk about the impact of traumatic experiences on developing healthy relationships. Uh, I get a lot of inquiries from people that are struggling in developing uh, relationships, sustaining relationships, being able to secure healthy, functional relationships, and even being able to understand what that means. And many times, I mean, uh, significantly, uh, there are these people who are struggling in developing healthy relationships, uh, entering into healthy relationships, meaning the ability to interpret when something is good for you or discern when something is good for you and the lack of that ability, and it's tied to traumatic experiences. And while we use the word trauma a lot, we don't really understand the depth of how it works, how it impacts us, and why we behave a certain way. Because if you ask the average person who's doing something that is not conducive to productivity, conducive to health, conducive to furthering any positive agenda, they will tell you the behaviors that they have that are destructive aren't something they want to do, but then why are they doing it? Uh, some of the behaviors and reactions to certain things that, again, non-productive, non-effective, uh, and not conducive to product act, productive, act, uh, productive activity, uh, they'll tell you they don't want to do it, but why are they doing it? It's an understanding what, what, what has happened in the traumatic experience. It's an understanding the thought processes that are fueling consistent behavior, and it starts with habitual realities. Uh, habitual realities are the emotions, the thoughts, and the behaviors that are done automatically, redundantly, without practice, without thought. In other words, a habit is something that you do automatically, unconsciously, and you do it without thought. So it's done from the place of, I don't have to think to do it, it's just not normal. And what we find is 95 to 96% of our behavior is habitual. It's something that's controlled by the subconscious. It's an automatic response to a certain stimuli. Well, that is reached by redundancy. You do it over and over again until, it, you, be, until you get to a point where the body is able to do it without consulting the mind. And that means that it's become a habit. You, you drive predominantly out of habit. Uh, your reactions and responses and uh, everything from stopping at a stoplight is habitual. It's not a conscious, uh, conscious thing. Now, there are times that you consciously make to try to beat a yellow light. But the, the normal driving process is that's why you can often sit up, and, and I've said this many times before, you can often sit up and you're driving home and you'll get home and don't remember how you got there because you didn't do it consciously. You were probably in thought about something else that's going on in your life or anticipating something, planning something, paying attention to something, getting lost in a particular song on the radio. All these different things will distract your conscious, but your subconscious is what's holding everything down. So then the condition of your subconscious is where your reality is going to be experienced most predominantly. In other words, you can say on an average, 95 to 96% of everything you experience on a daily basis is the result of your subconscious. Only about 4% of what you're doing is a conscious reality, meaning that it's, it's the result of what you're thinking consciously and through your will. And so that's why I tell people all the time, 
willpower won't work. Willpower will get you uh, the decision made. Willpower will get the intent going. Willpower may get you started, but because 96% of your behavior isn't connected to your consciousness, willpower isn't enforced. It has to be habitual. It has to be something you train yourself to do. Well, let's, let, let, let's go back a little bit. We, we, we say, okay, well, what's the problem with the behavior? Well, what happens with a person who goes through a traumatic experience? Whether, let's say, uh, a kid's molested. Um, one time is enough to call, uh, cause what we call PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, a lot of things come out of post-traumatic stress disorder, everything from hypervigilance of fear of, foreshortened, of a foreshortened future, meaning they don't believe they're going to live long, uh, and, and, and so much more. There are these cluster of behaviors that are common in people who are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay, uh, then let's say that the, there's a kid who is molested multiple times over the course of their childhood. They are now victims of, instead of a traumatic event and li liably experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder, they are victims of multiple traumatic experiences and are suffering from uh, something that's a new area of thought over the last few years in psychology, and that is complex trauma, meaning that you've experienced trauma multiple times and that has a more emphatic effect on you traumatically. Okay, now imagine how many people you know in your family, including yourself, that qualify for the second complex trauma, the more intensive form of a traumatic experience, traumatic event. Now, there's a difference in experiencing a traumatic event and being traumatized. Not everybody that has a traumatic experience is traumatized by the experience. And we're not going to get into the depths of how that works, but uh, there are people who were at ground zero on the day of 9-11 that weren't traumatized. They experienced the trauma, but for whatever reason, and there are a number of different reasons why it didn't traumatize them. Well, the people that, and, and I'll tell you this much, people that aren't normally traumatized by one big effect, emphatic event that's traumatic is that they live so high above this bar, bar of traumatic encounter. In other words, say that there's, there's this bar in your life. And if you live a life of joy, a life of happiness, where you're not constantly dealing with stress, you're not constantly dealing with anxiety, you're not constantly dealing with frustration, you have learned how to manage your life in a way that you are in a place of peace and joy the, the vast majority of the time, then you're, 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 you're living your life high above this bar. This bar represents, if you fall below this bar in, in your existence, in your experience in life, you're now traumatized. Well, you're way up here. So if something happens, it knocks you down here. You, you, it, it, it got to you, it, it impacted you, but it didn't traumatize you. But people that are living every day with stress, people going through stress, worried about losing their jobs, worried about their kids, worried about uh, money, worried about whatever. Somebody's gotten uh, shot. Somebody's been incarcerated. And these are just constant things you're dealing with every day. You're real close to that line if you're not already under it. So any event that's traumatic was probably going to traumatize you. And so that's, that, that's the quick explanation. But uh, one of the leaders, if not the foremost leader in uh, the study of tra uh, traumatic memory and traumatic experience and traumatic healing is Dr. Basil uh, van der Kolk. And uh, one thing that Dr. van der Kolk says is that the body keeps the score. And most people don't see it that way. Most people, when they think of trauma, they think psychologically, they think emotionally, they think it's in your head. But actually, before it's in your head, and before it's controlling what's going on in your thought processes, it's actually in your body. Your body, actually your cells and everything. If you think about something, uh, the way that we imprint memories, the way that we imprint memories into our brain is through emotional, emotional intensity. In other words, any experience you have, the more emotion, whether it's good emotion or bad emotion that you associate with it, the deeper the imprint into the memory and the easier it is to recall. So the, uh, the actual feeling that you have, emotionally feeling, the feeling of the body, at the time that you have an experience creates the imprint. So if you have a traumatic experience, how you felt emotionally at that time was high. That was fear, that was probably anger, that was a bunch of other things, and it was intense. So it put this huge imprint, but it's also a feeling. 
And so the feeling precedes what, 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 what happens with the mind because the feeling is the first thing that the body recognizes. It's part of the flight, fight or flight mode. Now the, the brain may send the signal for the fear, but the body experiences it. And so the body, just like, it, it, just like your body in, uh, remembers to hit the brake and, and do everything else, it will remember so much as you train it. The problem is most of us train it wrong based off of different experiences. Well, what happens is you're going through this process and there's this thing called traumatic memory. And we've seen people go through this. People uh, experience traumatic memory and what is happening when they experience it. Most people think, well, it's something triggered a memory and they're remembering what they're going on and it's upsetting them. No. What we now know is when a person experiences traumatic memory, their body literally goes to a state in which they are reliving it and see the, the power of the emotion to send signals to the brain. And you have to understand, remember I told you uh, numerous times that the brain, uh, the subconscious brain and the, the, the subconscious mind and the non-conscious brain does not have the ability to distinguish between what's real and what's being imagined. So when the body starts to sense it, it doesn't start to remember it. It actually starts to relive it. As far as that person is concerned, they are back in that moment experiencing it all over again. Imagine that. Imagine that. So when you're, in try when you're trying to build a relationship, a functional, healthy relationship, and there are triggers that you may not even be aware of, and they're going, and then you are trying to respond based off of those triggers and those feelings, and you don't understand how to control yourself, you haven't healed. And what, what happens is you're trying to enter into a world of functionality from a place of high and uncontrollable dysfunction. You are trying to say, because I don't talk about it, it doesn't impact me. Because I don't discuss it, because I don't think about it, it's not impacting me. But until you deal with the issue, until you deal with what you went through in whatever stage of faith, and this isn't just about children, this is about, there are some people who have went through some horrible relationships, uh, domestic violence and, and so much more. There are people who have struggled financially to the point to where it had a massive imprint on them. And so they are going to be triggered by financial um, issues. You got people who were cheated on, and so when they get in a situation and they see certain behavior, it automatically triggers. So they're not just being, uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, suspect, they're, they're not just suspicious of a person, they're reliving it. So literally someone that had nothing to do with it is about to get the brunt of the experience because they're reliving it. And that's where the intensity comes from. Here's the thing. How do you heal? And like I say, this is going to carry over into the, the quantum thing, but I want to talk about how do you heal. It says, as a man thinks, so is he. But a lot of what a man is thinking is being triggered by how he feels about something. Remember, it's your emotions that do the imprinting. So the body when the body senses something, it, it sends a signal to the brain, and the brain says, okay, this, when the body's feeling like this, this is what's happening. And so the body doesn't know that it's just a thought that triggered it. And that is not the real thing. The brain doesn't know that. The brain can't distinguish. So the brain starts to behave. And then you start to relive. You start to recreate because remember, your thoughts are the seeds of your destiny. And so you create this cycle of sensing something, responding to it in a negative way, and then re-intensifying the imprint. Um, how do you get past that? You have to understand. We are people of, uh, of habit. We do things over and over again. We normally wake up around the same time, get out of bed on the same side, uh, hit the snooze button or not the same way, uh, do your bathroom routine the same way, get up, uh, go to work, office, uh, wherever you do after when you first leave the house the same way, taking the same route, doing the same thing. You never, ch you never challenge your mind or your body to take on something new. And, and when you do, what you find out is the body's not used to it. The, the first time that a person says, okay, I do is think negative. So I'm today I'm gonna start thinking positive. Whatever you think negative about, I'm gonna think positive. And what will happen actually is you will find out that your body has been chemically, become chemically addicted to the bad feeling. And even though it's a bad feeling coming from a bad thought process, 
the body is demanding it. So the more that you start to try to say, okay, I'm going to think positive, the body isn't getting the normal experience. And there are experiences that you experience throughout the day that create this cycle of training of dysfunction. Okay. If you are a person that's impatient, you probably have a time of day when you're traveling to work in traffic that you are angry. You're hostile. Why? Because of the slow traffic, because of people cutting you off, because of all that. Then if you have, the body's used to that. The body knows around whatever time it is you travel to work, around this time of the day, I'm going to have this type of feeling. And it starts to expect it. And if you don't have that feeling that day, the body sends a signal to the brain. What the hell's going on? And then the brain will automatically start searching for a reason to provide that feeling. And so you're, you're wondering, why do I keep doing this? It's because your body is placing a demand on the brain. In other words, we don't think, when we think about the uh, unconscious mind or the non-conscious mind, we think about the immaterial aspects. But what we don't realize is that the body also functions as a part of our unconscious mind. It has the ability to create realities by how you feel. This feeling you get in your body is coming from different chemicals being released. And when the body doesn't get that through normal stimuli, okay, I'm in traffic, so I'm angry. Now I get to work and I'm anxious and I'm irritable because, okay, or, you know, right around the time that the boss walks in every morning, you get really, really anxious and irritable because the boss always has something negative to say to you. So as that time of day starts to approach, you start to get irritable and the body knows this. The body knows not only what's coming, but when. And what happens is you're waking up every morning. And here's the other part. You're starting your day off in the negative. You're waking up every morning with, and the first thing the average person does is when they wake up is they start to think about all the things that are wrong. No matter what it is, they think about what's going wrong and how they're going to deal with it during the day. So they start their day off with a negative cycle that's fueling the physiological responses, reinforcing the negative thought cycle, and you get this thing going, 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 going. And a lot of times, by the time you get finished getting dressed in the morning, you're on 10 in anxiety, 10 in worry, 10 in frustration. It's because you woke up that way. That's why I am real heavy on teaching gratitude. As soon as you open your eyes in the morning, think of something to be grateful for. You have it. I don't care where you're at in your life, what you're going through. There's something to be grateful for. The fact that you still got an opportunity to go out and change your situation is something to be grateful for. And so that you, you've got to wake up and with gratitude. But when you don't, you wake up and you start off. Now, here's the problem. You can't change your thought patterns. You can't change your behavior patterns if you're currently reinforcing them by doing the same thing over and over and over again. You're not training your body and your brain for change. You're reinforcing routine, habit. And so you wake up, you got this bad thing going, you're thinking bad, you, you're already going. And so now the body just follows suit and you have the thought reinforcing the feeling, the feeling reinforcing the thought and you keep going. And the thing is, the moment you try to change it, it feels, um, uh, I hear people talk all the time, you know, I, I was going to do it this way. I tried this new thing, but it just didn't feel right. I hear that all the time. It just didn't feel right. What people are actually saying is it didn't feel familiar. Literally, you've got it. You've got it. Um, you've had it happen to you. Something's going on and you're trying to do something and you say it don't feel right because literally your body is responding to it. There's a feeling. Some people say they get butterflies in their stomach. That's an actual uh, physiological response to a perceived reality. Right. So you've got all this thing going. But what happens is you try something new, but then your body doesn't feel the way it normally feels. And you say, man, it doesn't feel right. No, it doesn't feel familiar. And that's one of the biggest problems uh, and inhibitors to healing is that the healing process takes you to a place that you're unfamiliar with. There are some new feelings that are taking place that you're not used to. And the body is at the same time craving the old feelings, even though those feelings aren't attached to anything good. And that is like any other addiction. You have to overcome it. You have to put the body in a place and introduce it to new things. Now, here's the thing. This is what you do. You're creating your reality in your thinking. There's a reason that it says, as a man thinks in his heart, meaning the deepest resource, re, uh, recesses of his soul, 
as a man thinks in his heart, talking about the subconscious mind. That when you when you're looking at something biblically, you have the noose and the cardia. The noose is the conscious mind, the cart, and that when the what the what the Bible translates as mind and cardia, what the Bible translates as heart. It's both the mind, it's two different lobes of the human mind, so to speak. You have the conscious and the subconscious. You, and then you have what's known as gnosis, general knowledge, and epic gnosis, deep knowledge that is a part of the internal process of behavior, meaning that you've taken some knowledge that you've got gnosis, and you have now used that gnosis and applied it and allowed it to be a force, meaning that you gave a certain level of priority to the knowledge when you encountered it, and now it is influential in your development. It's the development of a new neural pathway with a new idea, with new expectations, new standards, and new possibilities. And that's where you create the process of healing, is in the development of new neural pathways in your brain, new associations and idea in your mind, in the cardia, the heart, the deepest recesses of the soul. You have to escape the old way of thinking, breaking old patterns, breaking old habits, and creating new ones, which can only be done through repetition. Now, here's the beauty of it. Because the mind, the brain, cannot, the mind and the brain cannot distinguish between what is being imagined or perceived, and what is happening in the third dimension or the three-dimensional world, meaning it's tangible, you can touch it, it's actually happening in the third dimension, because it can't distinguish. You can create these realities by visiting your future instead of staying in the past. Because see, when you wake up in the morning and you're worrying about all this stuff that's going to go wrong in your life, that idea that things are going to go wrong comes from an old idea an old experience. So literally the brain in its current state, if you don't work on it, functions as an archive or a record of your past behaviors or your past experiences. And it's study recalling these past experiences and it's producing expectations. And that's uh, where your predictability is coming from. That's why you are anticipating things going wrong because you are using your brain as an archive and it can only produce what you've experienced but then you are now narrowing the possibilities of your future because you're living everything based on your past. So what you have to do is have the ability to go in, close your eyes, clear out your head, shut off as much of the stimuli as possible. Uh, if you got headphones, you can play some soft music or some water uh, flowing. Uh, it's great. Keep your eyes closed because the more you see, the more stimuli is in the brain, the more the brain is going to be tempted to engage the stimuli or form ideas and thoughts based on the stimuli, close your mind. Now you are starting to get to the point where you're creating an idea. The idea becomes an image and because the brain cannot distinguish between whether it's real or not, the more you're able to focus on that image, the more real the feeling and the experience. You're literally training your body how to feel when you come out of your current situation. You're training your body how it's going to feel and, and, and to seek it, to, to, to demand it. You're literally training your body to say, this is the new feeling. This is what it feels like to win. This is what it feels like to be powerful. This is what it feels like to be on top. Now, one of the problems that we have is that we've been trained on what reality is. So, if we can't touch it and we can't feel it, we don't normally see it that way. So we don't ever go out there. We think uh, we wait on external forces to create realities for us to be responsive to emotionally. But we have the power as a man thinks, so is he not as a man experiences. Check me out now, I'm trying to get you somewhere. It says as a man thinks, it doesn't say as a man experiences. So is he. It says as he thinks. So what it says is that you've been given the gift to think beyond where you're at, create the new reality before, and actually experience the new reality before you're actually able to touch it. Why? Because the experiencing of it creates a new feeling in the body that the body will automatically demand from the brain. The brain will go seek it. What the, body, what, what, what the body's feelings and emotions are, the brain will actually go out and find. The, there's no limitations to what your mind and your brain can do.
this healing is possible. I don't care what you've been through. A lot of you are suffering from traumatic memory and don't realize that a lot of people are sabotaging relationships because they're consistently living in the past. You have to get your brain to a point to where it's no longer primarily focused on the past. It stops being, at the point when you're able to create in your mind, conceive. Remember I say this, conception is powerful. I say this all the time. If you can conceive it in your mind, that's God's evidence to you that it's possible, right? So then when you are a person who is more focused on what you can conceive uh, than what you've been through, then you create these new realities. And now guess what? Your brain goes from being an archive of the past or a record keeper of the past to a map of your future. You can predict your future by monitoring your thoughts. This isn't a happenstance world. This isn't a hit or miss happenstance, I might, I might world. We live in inconsistencies because we think inconsistently or we consistently go over what we've been through, giving more power to our experiences than our ability to create new ones. One of the other factors, and I talked about this earlier, that uh, one of the other factors that plays a major role in whether a person is traumatized within a trauma traumatic experience is we talked about the fact that, you know, where they exist on this, you know, in their current state, you know, if you're in a state of peace and joy and, and, and fulfillment, happiness and power, you're going to have less of an effect. We already talked about this. Here's another thing that plays a major role in whether or not you're going to be uh, traumatized when you experience trauma. And that is how much are you participating in the actual experience to overcome the experience? In other words, a gunman walks into a room and starts to shoot people. The person that jumps up and starts getting people out the room or the person that tries to go and attack it. Like for instance, the guy that everybody's celebrating now from the Waffle House that literally ran and bum rushed the shooter and fought him and took the gun away from him and everything like right now, if you were to sit down and talk to him, it's less likely that he's traumatized by that experience. Why? Because he participated not only in saving his own life, but in saving others. Now you are going, you'll find somebody that was cowering behind the counter and just knew they were going to die and nothing was going to happen and somebody had to come save them. They're more likely to be traumatized because they didn't participate. They didn't execute any power. They have this emotional sense of helplessness. And that, especially in the areas of fear of foreshortened future, they're, they're walking around on 10. Hypervigilance, everything around them is something wrong. Anxiety, constant fear, all of these different elements are, are there and they're heightened and they're traumatized. And they're going to have to go through a process of healing. And one of the first steps is taking control. It was the fact that you weren't in control that opened you up to the trauma in the first place. That's why preparation is so powerful in this world. When you are prepared to take on the challenges of life, and you might not even know what that next challenge is, but when you are prepared and you have a mental mindset, not just physically, but a mental mindset to where you are responsive instead of reactive to where you automatically go into something that's gonna put you in the best situation to win, survive, overcome, or conquer. You come out better. We are trained to look to someone else to do almost everything for us. And when times come where we are pushed to the brink, we can't respond correctly. But when you're talking about starting a relationship with someone, and it doesn't have to be romantic. It can be a friendship. It can be a business partnership. It can be a lot of different things. But if you're talking about starting a relationship with someone and you've got all of these things that are going on, first of all, imagine trying to sustain a positive, functional, healthy relationship when everything you always encounter and see and feel is about somebody doing harm to you. If you can't trust somebody, you can't have a healthy relationship with them. If you're gonna be accusing somebody of something, every time you turn around, you can't have a healthy relationship. If everything that you interpret turns out to be something bad, you can't have a, a healthy relationship. You've gotta go back and deal 
with the causality. We've got to peel things back and deal with cause. Now, the beautiful thing about cause and effect is it's so much bigger than we make it. The way most people who even understand or look at cause and effect, see cause and effect, is they say, okay, this happened to me. I need to find the cause. And then when you find the cause, you say, okay, at least I know where it came from. Now, what most people do is they stop there. They found the cause that created the effect, and now they're leery of it. They're running from it. They're trying to avoid it. They're doing everything they can to stay away from that cause. No, your greatest power, listen to me, and then I'm, I'm going to be done. Listen, your greatest power is becoming the cause. Not the cause of what's wrong, but the cause of the remedy, the cause of the new uh, empowerment, the cause of the conquering, the cause of the positivity, the cause of winning. You have the ability to find the cause of your negative situations and become the cause that replaces that negative situation with a positive one. That's what God planted inside of each and every one of us. It's when you become the cause and start dictating the effect that your life begins to change. That's where healing takes place. Healing is when you re-seize your sovereignty in this world and you begin to declare and establish in your thoughts and in your speech and in your behavior what your future looks like. You have the power to heal. I mean completely heal. It was given to you. Long before there were pharmaceutical companies, people were being healed. Long before the first herbalist hit the planet, people were being healed. When I began to study multi-generational transmission of trauma, I came across a field, a little known field called epigenetics. We're gonna talk about epigenetics Friday. We're going to talk about the quantum world of how our thoughts create energy and how that energy has the power to heal. While some people are more prone to different diseases and how it's attached to your thoughts. And it, it, it's, it's, it's amazing how powerful our thoughts are. But we're not using them to our benefit. We are suffering because we still allow our brains to be a record of our past experiences rather than converting it to a map of our future con uh, conquests. And here's where, again, and I'm gonna say this and then I'm done. I, I know I keep saying that, I'm gonna say this and I'm done. It's not in trying to make the experience produce the thought and the behavior it's in getting the thought and the behavior to produce the experience. A lot of people are waiting on an external reality to happen so they can rejoice. A lot of people are waiting on an external reality so they can get up and they can, they can raise their hand in victory. They're waiting on something on the outside of them to happen so they can feel a certain way on the inside. You're waiting on something external to change what's on the inside. No, you change what's on the inside. You start living victorious before you see victory. You start living power before you experience power. You start living financial abundance before you experience it. You've got to start living in it because your body is controlling the thought, and the thought is controlling the destiny. As a man thinks in his heart, the deepest recesses of his soul, so is he. That being said, I'm out of here. Don't forget, if you haven't gotten uh, your copy of Critical Mass, Definitely get it. If you haven't gotten your uh, copy of my wife's first book, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, if you know anybody that's been through trauma as a child, uh, childhood sexual abuse in any form, uh, growing up in a house where uh, people are being incarcerated, it's traumatic. It's really, it has a very powerful, and I'm going to talk about uh, uh, adverse experiences. Uh, adverse childhood experiences, which are known as ACEs, and how it impacts the uh, functionality of people all through life. I mean, adverse childhood experiences don't stop after you become an adult. 
they continuously have an impact. They are a form of trauma and they are consistent. Uh, 70%, nearly seven, I think 67% of people in this country have at least one ACE, one adverse childhood experience. And it's when it gets to that four, that fourth one, because you're getting a point for each one. When you get to four points, meaning you've got at least four of those adverse experiences in your life, chance of heart disease, ischemic heart disease, which is the number one killer in America, triples. Diabetes, the chance for risk of diabetes triples. We're not even talking about diet. We're just talking about what this will do. And, and, and there are so many other. Now, the chance of suicidality, meaning that you are attempting to take your life 12 times more. Depression, three and a half times more. We need to learn how to heal. We have to facilitate healing. That's what I love about this book. This book is about, if you knew my wife's story, and I can talk about it because she's made it public, she's very transparent, but if you knew her story, the vast majority of the people who didn't know the outcome, but just knew the beginning, would swear she didn't make it. They would swear she either ended up in prison, she ended up dead, she ended up addicted to drugs, uh, something went wrong. But there's something more powerful than any condition, anything you experience in this life, there's something more powerful. God put the ability to put your desires and your wishes out front and demand something of yourself greater than you feel you have the capacity to complete. That's where faith comes in. That's where you start to believe in the impossible. That's where you start to demand the impossible. I heard um, Tony Robbins say that life will pay you whatever price you demand of it. What he failed to follow up with and why so many people get caught up is in, but you have to meet the man, you have to, you have to meet the demands that life places on you. See, life will pay whatever price you demand on it, but when you make a demand on life, life counters your demand. You know, a uh, prime example, I had a guy come to me and say, I, I want to save my marriage. I want my marriage to be better. I want to be a better husband. And, and my counter was, I, I represented life. He was making a demand on life by making a demand to me. He was making a demand on life that he wanted a better marriage. And life countered through me by saying, okay, you got to tell your boys you can't go out with them three times a week. See, life counters. Most people don't want to meet the counter. Most people want to place a demand, but they don't want to make the changes. Life will pay you whatever price you demand. Of. Are you willing to make the changes? You, you got to be willing to become in order to acquire. With that being said, look, I'm going to get out of here. I can get into this and I can talk about this all day, but we've got to heal. One of the reasons there's so much dysfunction, one of the reasons there's so much hatred, one of the reasons there's so much uh, disruption in, 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 in encounters and, 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 and people killing people for the most uh, idiotic and asinine reasons and, and, and people sinking into broken and hateful and destructive relationships is because they haven't healed. You're trying to walk into something and hope it's functional when you are literally breathing dysfunction that you are bringing from your past into your present and pushing into the future. You gotta get away from that. You got to heal. Look, as I always say, I'm gonna live my life on full. I'm gonna give the world everything I have so that when I leave this place, I die on E. Having done everything that I was placed here to do, and I'm, I'm challenging you to do the same thing. With that being said, I'm out of here.